Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Global Hydraulic Cement Underlayment, Self-Leveling Underlayment New Standards for Tile and Stone. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association. I want to welcome you and uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to watch uh, today's webinar. It's sponsored by Custom Building Products. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you'll be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone. As a reminder, all NTCA webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented giving you easier access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. Here we go. Today's speaker, Mike Michalizzi, is the Senior Director of Technical Services for Custom Building Products. He is based at their research and training facility, Custom Technical University, located in Santa Fe Springs, California. In this role, Mike assists industry professionals with recommendations and commercial excuse me, on commercial and residential projects uh, varying in uh, installation, uh, presenting a variety of installation challenges. He also presents Custom's top tip, top five tips, educational video series. Please check those out, they're great. Prior to becoming involved in product technology, Mike owned a tile and stone installation company in New Haven, Connecticut. He currently serves on the technical committees for the Tile Council of North America, Materials and Methods Standards Association, National Tile Contractors Association, Natural Stone Institute, American National Standards Institute, and the ASTM International. Welcome, Mike. Look forward to your program. I know you'll do a great job. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time out of your busy day to uh, come and visit with us and talk about our new standard. And uh, thanks to the NTCA for given us this venue to, to talk about these things. Um, the flowable cement, flowable hydraulic cement underlayment, self-leveling underlayment, it's a long title for a standard, and we'll talk about how that came about. Um, but that uh, was approved at the end of last year. And so far, it's uh, been very successful in uh, helping everyone to understand what the minimum requirements are for those products. I'd like to talk a little bit about the background of where it came about and why self-leveling uh, underlayment is, is very important in our industry. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, we'd like to thank the resilient flooring industry. Um, much of the installation um, information, most of the testing that was done in the new ANSI standard is is actually res, uh, as a result of what happened in the resilient industry. The ASTM C1708, for example, we quote often in the standard for our self-leveling for ANSI, we quote to perform the testing according to ASTM C1708. 1708 was in the works shortly before the committee got together and worked on the ANSI uh, methods, and they were always slightly ahead of us. And especially with the um, method standards, uh, F2873 and the practice uh, F710, we owe a lot to that uh, industry for developing those standards or those practices. And what they did is they set the bar for what a self-leveling product was. Because if you remember, um, self-leveling was really a tool that was used mostly in the resilient industry. And I'd like to say that the reason that self-leveling came about was because there was patch. And any of you who've ever done vinyl composition tile, anyone who's patched for flooring uh, installations, you know what a bear it is in order to install patch. It's so labor intensive, time consuming. You spread your patch, you let it dry, you scrape the high spots, you repatch, 
you scrape the high spots, you repatch, you screen it, you sand it, you have to go crazy to get a really, really slick surface. And because of that, when self-leveling came around for the resilient industry, well, it was a no-brainer. It was just something that the flooring installers were going to move very quickly on using because uh, one lift, you get a smooth surface. Uh, as you look in the picture, I'd rather be those guys standing up working, pouring a product and moving it around as opposed to being on my knees, spreading thousands and thousands of square feet of patch, and then having to redo it over and over and over again in order to get it right. So for a long time, self-leveling was something that some of tile installers used, but it really didn't catch on uh, for a long time. It was out for decades before it uh, came into the tile industry, where today self-leveling is a part of all flooring. And the reason for that is primarily because our methods of installing tile or stone, they mostly relate to uh, creating slopes and pitches, and also mortar beds were used to support large and heavy tile or stone. And so when you think about the use of it in the tile industry, uh, self-leveling products are uh, or were not often recommended. And because of the uh, popularity of membranes, self-leveling now has become more of a norm because uh, self-leveling products are not recommended in wet areas. Uh, because of some of the components in them, the wet areas uh, can actually destroy uh, a self-leveling product. And they're the vast majority of them. And so when it comes to tile and stone, well, we relied on the old mortar bed method. But what ended up happening was um, mortar beds have become less and less popular uh, because of the expense of a mortar bed, uh, because of the diminishing skills for those who don't install mortar beds. Well, it got down to different methods, as you can see in the picture, of tile level. And how many of these have we seen as manufacturers? We've seen where just a, a trowel is used, like for example, a half inch notch trowel, and a tile is placed on the very top of the ridge and locked into place with a leveling tool or a leveling clip, or just placed on top of these ridges in order to make the surface flat or level. And then we have the just add a little more thin set in the middle, and instead of doing a mortar bed and making up for the the lack of preparation on the substrate. And then the ever-ending problem or never-ending problem of spot bonding, which is a real problem in our industry today. And a good portion of it is because surface preparation, such as the use of levelers, is just not done. And yet the surface of the tile has to be level. So in these cases, we see spot bonding is a common occurrence. When it comes to a thin elevation having to be flat, uh, for many of you who are installing the large format tiles today, uh, you may not remember where two by twos and one by ones were the norm uh, for installation. And yet the attitude back then was, well, the two by twos and the one by ones, they kind of conform to the substrate. So you really don't have to prep as much. But there were a lot of occasions where you'd go from one area to another where you'd have to patch. And for tile installers, they would make, um, as we did, we made our own mixes or patches because we needed a sand, cement, and latex that could withstand um, a lot of water or sometime exposure to, the, um, to heavy traffic. And we made our own patches. But that, again, was very, very time consuming. And self-leveling is really the way to go. What's also made self-leveling so popular is the type of tile that we install nowadays. And um, I don't envy tile installers today who are installing these four foot or five foot or larger uh, formats. But without a doubt, you have to have a very, very flat surface. As you look at the list here, that's a long list of requirements 
or issues that you have to deal with in order to install tile today. So self-leveling is definitely uh, the norm before you install any type of one of these uh, large format tiles. You just uh, don't get concrete that's that flat. And the other issue that we see is uh, with our mortar beds, we have a certain elevations that we require. For example, a minimum three quarter inch. And that adds a lot of weight to the substrate. And it also, the time consuming and the mixture, the, the labor that's involved, there's a lot more involved in installing mortar beds, trying to make up for elevation issues. Whereas we see with leveler, you get that slick, nice, beautiful surface with uh, a very thin layer that's also very strong. And because of that, it definitely is an accepted practice, not just for resilient, uh, the, the resilient uh, materials and the ceramic and stone, but just about for wood, for um, carpet, a lot of the installations on the entire project are being used uh, or installed with self-leveling. So it really is a norm, and for that reason, we really did need something specific to tiling stone because in order to get the surfaces as flat as you see in this picture, we needed to have a fast, easy method, and therefore self-leveling has really become uh, very popular. Unfortunately, there are still some that are afraid of self-leveling, and um, they end up uh, patching or um, doing other types of prep. And we we'll also go back to the old build up with inset. So it's something that if we can appreciate where the standard came from, uh, people would have less um, res reservations about using self-leveling. The self-leveling standard uh, in the time frame that I've been involved in the um, Materials and Methods Standards Association, uh, unfortunately, I think it's been the, the standard that's been the longest in development. Uh, testing actually started in 2013 um, and went all the way to 2021 before the standard was actually approved. And for those of you who aren't aware of how a standard is developed uh, in our industry, uh, basically the manufacturers work together with a few consultants and some from labor, and they kind of develop uh, not just the product standard, but also a method standard. The product standard is mainly governed by the manufacturers. In this case, we had seven, seven, seven laboratories, majority manufacturers, and we had a few suppliers, such as uh, Kernios and Walker, um, join with the Tile Council of North America in order to develop the product standard. And that's important because if all the major manufacturers are performing the tests in a uniform manner, and according to a standard, then whenever a contractor purchases a bag of self-leveling or a specifier or says that self-leveling is going to be used on their project, well, they can be assured that they're going to have these minimum values uh, and that performance is already something that's tried and true. In this test, we did three rounds of multiple testing. It was a lot of work for all of these laboratories. And we got so much data that we were able to provide the first um, ANSI standard for tile that would have precision and biased analysis. So we were able to determine all of these labs' uh, performance and decide, okay, this is the uh, acceptable range and therefore different than the uh, standard for resilient, we were able to set standards within the standard for performance requirements. And we'll go into that in detail. Here's some of the key features of the new standard for the products, ANSI A118.16. And the key features are, number one is specific to tile and natural stone. As you saw in the uh, other self-leveling standards for resilient, there was a note that said that those standards could be applied to other finishes, but none of them included ceramic tile or natural stone. 
The other thing is that this standard also only applies to hydraulic cement. Uh, in the ANSI definitions, gypsum is not considered a hydraulic cement, and gypsum underlayment is not included in the standard. The reason for that is in order to dry gypsum, you'd have to put it in an oven in order to uh, facilitate uh, the testing that you don't have to do with the different types of Portland and calcium aluminum cement. So that was a big difference. Um, it also covers standard and rapid hardening formulas. And we also tested lightweight formulas, um, but because of the standard of being greater than 3000 PSI compressive strengths, not all lightweights are gonna meet that standard. Uh, so the, uh, they weren't included in the ANSI 118.16. And as the footnote says, you can still use a lightweight SLU, but the um, contributing factor on a project in order to meet the 3000 PSI, you may have to use a standard cement or a standard weight cement over the lightweight and cap it in order to reach that 3000 PSI requirement for the um, applications. So what are some of the details within the standard? Well, most people refer to uh, self-leveling as a highly engineered formula. And the reality is it is. Um, there's, it's a very complicated formula. And in order to meet all of these physical properties that are listed in the table, um, there's a variety of products that are added into this self-leveling. And as you see on the right, it's interesting how it works is that there are materials or chemicals within a leveler that cause it to expand. So that way when it shrinks, it shrinks back to the, to the desired um, volume that you'd want on your floor. Otherwise, if you were to put it something that didn't have shrinkage compensation materials in there, what would end up happening is you'd pour this thin layer of cement and water on your floor and it would shrink and crack and peel right off your floor. So all of the manufacturers have to design their products so that they expand in a certain state and then shrink back to a normal state. Here are some of the um, requirements and this is important for contractors especially because they need to know that they're going to have a product that they can actually work with. And under these requirements, the flow of the product has to reach a certain diameter. So you'd pour this out of a cone and it has to flow on its own to a certain diameter. It also has to heal, and we'll show you some pictures of what that means, and set in a certain amount of time. And as you can see, it's going, to, it's going to heal for greater than 10 minutes, but it's gonna set within 20. So that's a very short window. And what that shows is these, chemi these chemicals and the balance of the product have to be really well designed, really well engineered in order to work properly. The compressive strengths, we'll talk a little bit further about them, uh, are important. But the 3000 PSI was, was decided upon because of the ASTM F710. AF, the, that particular ASTM uh, required that the compressive strength be 3000 PSI. The levelers that you see out in the market today generally uh, reach over 4000 PSI. So just as you would build a bridge that you tell someone that you know it can manage up to a ton, you really develop it so that it can manage more than a ton, you don't want it to fail at exactly a ton. And that's how the manufacturers uh, thought about it. Now the shrinkage part of this is important because there are so many different formulas made by different manufacturers that the way that the product shrinks and the, the timing of the shrinkage, we really couldn't put a, a requirement in the standard that would say it has to shrink or not shrink within a period of time. So that's why you'll see shrinkage is not included in the formulas uh, requirements. So what do we mean by flow? Well, 
flow means that the product is going to move on its own. It's going to try to seek level. So as it tries to do that, it has to do it up to a certain rate. And that that's uh, its initial flow here is um, recorded for a rapid setting uh, material, a rapid hardening material. Um, that's that set. If you look at the picture on the right, healing is very important because you're going to pour your material uh, in in strips or in rows, and you're going to meld the two together. If the healing process didn't last for an extended period of time, and this is greater than 10 minutes, you wouldn't get the product to be able to uh, weld itself together between ribbons or rows, and you wouldn't be able to get the product to um, move when you're trying to reach certain elevations. And then as far as set time or firming in place, that's also important because, especially if you're trying to meet elevations, but you want the product to set up in a certain amount of time so you can uh, achieve the elevation and the hardness uh, that you're going to need on your project. Another important factor that we had in our uh, in the standard is that if a if a thin set adhesive mortar has to meet a certain standard for adhering to the substrate or membrane or any other product in our industry, then the levelers would also have to meet a minimum standard. Standard is um, recorded in tensile strength. And as you can see here, these are the different modes of failure. So in the first three, um, that mode of failure has to achieve a minimum of 145 PSI in 28 days. And if it doesn't meet that, then um, the product doesn't meet the standard. If you look at this diagram here, the one on the right is uh, actually a failure in the process. So this bond failure is an epoxy bond failure. It's not relevant. So if you see these types of failures out in, a, um, in an actual installation, the ones that um, we would prefer if you were to do this test out in the field, we'd prefer the number one and the number three because if the bond to the surface is stronger than the surface, then you know you have a very good uh, bonding system. And if uh, in number three, if you have the failure within the uh, leveling system, then you also know that you have a very high bond to the surface. Uh, and if it takes that much force, then you really shouldn't have any issues with your leveling. With compression, uh, for those of you who've never seen a, uh, a compressive uh, test done, we've got the, uh, uh, two inch cubes that are manufactured or made by the uh, technicians. And then they're broken in uh, these types of machinery. And the reason why we settled on these numbers were to develop something that was pretty consistent in the industry. Uh, concrete has a minimum requirement of greater or equal to 2,500 PSI. So we're actually greater than the minimum for concrete we're equal to the minimum for resilient flooring. And typically the application is going to determine which leveler you're gonna use. We'll go into detail a little further on about different types of leveler. And based on the different types of leveler, you'll get various compressive strengths. So to correspond with the product standard, ANSI 118.16, we also need a, needed a method standard. And the method standard is in the ANSI 108s. This is ANSI 108.21. And for those of you who don't know how these method standards are developed, um, it's a very interesting process. It's kind of like the um, uh, English Parliament. There's a lot of discussion that goes on and there's a lot of back and forth and everyone from their perspective uh, tries to help the other group understand what's important to them, also what's going to be important to a contractor on a project. 
So for these committee discussions, we'd have the manufacturers that were in the MMSA that developed the product standard. The National Tile Contractors Association was uh, also very um, active in this um, in this role, discussing how the product should be installed, what are some of the nuances, uh, what are some of the requirements for installation, and what is the intended use of the product. Also, others that were in the ANSI committee, uh, we got together in discussions. And this, believe it or not, this was over a two year period where these discussions and debates and um, development of the standard took place. And one of the issues was uh, over contractual issues. And we'll talk about that because that explains why we have such a long name for the product. Um, for years, or I wish to say for decades, the product was called the self-leveling underlay. And the company that launched that name, um, and they, they launched the name because the product flows on its own. It kind of, when you pour it on the floor, it seeks level. So in, in their perspective, it was that the product was a self-acting product and kind of flowing to seek level. For those of you who, are, who um, have ever used a water level, you know that water kind of seeks its own level. And so the, the fluidity of the product that we see as self-leveler uh, also has the same action. It kind of self-acts to level itself on its own. But um, the issue that we had in the committees was there is a perspective out there from the general contractors. The general contractors believe, well, if it's such an easy product, then you really shouldn't charge me that much to install it. And there was a lot of objections in the technical committee about that because without a doubt, everyone will admit that installing leveler does take skill and there's a lot of effort involved. It's not something you just pour and go, but you also have to move it around. The other major issue was that um, the product is not intended or used primarily for uh, leveling. The majority, the great majority of, of self-leveling or global hydraulic cement underlayment use is just to flatten the floor, make it smooth, bring it into tolerance uh, that we require in ANSI for lippage and uh, for surface preparation. And what the contractors were saying is that they would flatten the floor and then they'd have a general contractor come back and say, well, no, you have to level the floor. And leveling is a lot more work, a lot more product. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that it's not always feasible. And so that was a discussion that took place and a good one. And it really is going to help in specifications. The CSI specification, for example, refers to leveler as product uh, that is applied in a quarter of an inch or greater and can be feather edged at edges to match adjacent floor elevations. Well, so what that shows is that you're not always going to level, you're going to flatten. And in these specifications, contractors need to be protected so that they weren't required to perform leveling uh, much more expensive on a project than actually just flattening. So that was, a, that was a great part of the standard. And here you see it in the ANSI 10821. I've highlighted uh, the important areas there. So um, in section 111, it clearly says right off the bat, the intended use is to flatten the substrate. And it also says to the specifier that if leveling is designated, it has to be clearly expressed in the, expressed in the project specification. So this from a contractual point of view will protect contractors. And so this is a great addition uh, to the standard. On the other hand, for leveling, 
uh, it points out that leveling is a specialized use of the other land. It also says that there's going to be additional labor involved. So this helps you to justify the extra work, the extra product, the extra labor that would be included in order to provide leveling. Now we said earlier that leveling may not be uh, possible on every project. And this is especially true when you have renovations. If you were to actually level some of these buildings, we've seen them out of level over four inches. Uh, there may not be an opportunity for you to get through a doorway. If you were to place tile in, in one room and have to level it using these leveling pins, um, you're going to bring it up to a certain elevation and then you're going to have a great step going into the next room. So it's really important that it be clearly defined in a specification and this standard will help you uh, if you run into the situation where someone wants you to level because a product is called a self-leveling underlay. There are other things that the standard helps with and there are certain things regarding the use of self-levelers we have to be very careful of. Um, we have different contractors that might install a, a self-leveling product. You have the tile contractor and he has ANSI and Tile Council that gives uh, certain information uh, as to how to do surface preparation, treatment of cracks, etc. We have the flooring contractor who has very different uh, recommendations in their standards. And then you have a leveling contractor who, like the concrete finishers, are just interested in getting the product installed. And their uh, extent of looking at what the flooring contractor and the tile contractor does is not always uh, on par. For example, we've seen leveling contractors uh, come in and pour leveler over cracks in the slab and the specification called out for the floor for the tile contractor to put a crack isolation membrane over all the cracks well you can imagine a tile contractor coming in after a leveling contractor sees a beautiful floor there's no cracks so he doesn't use a membrane and later on the cracks transfer through the tile and then you know all the finger pointing gets uh, going because uh, who is really responsible for the fact that now these cracks are breaking the tile or cracking the ground. So it's so important to understand these practices, especially if you're not doing the leveling on the project. So if we look at the standard ANSI 10821, we can see the recommendations that uh, they call out to refer to TCNA EJ171. In, TG, in EJ171, it says all of these joints, including saw cuts or contraction joints, all of these are to be carried through the tile work. Well, if you look at the flooring manufacturer, their ASTM F710, it says just fill them with patch and move on. If you look at section 4.2. So that's a little different than, um, than our recommendations in the tile industry. As you can see in 421, um, they have to honor expansion joints, but you'll also find that many of them uh, take some other practices. And a lot of that comes into use when they use uh, a resin-based moisture mitigation system. For those of you who are not familiar with these, these are used uh, to, uh, they go underneath the self-leveling product and they block moisture vapor from coming up and affecting moisture sensitive materials above it. There is a system where you can uh, install these moisture mitigation products early um, at a stage when they're just pouring the concrete just a couple days or a day after and you install this membrane and then you level over the top of it. What that does is now that you have a, a flat elevation or a level elevation in the entire building before you start putting walls up or later on installing flooring. But 
as it brings out here in section 8.3 of this ASDM, treatment of isolation and expansion joints, as well as, as non-moving contraction joints and cracks, all of this has to be clearly defined. And as I stated earlier, we have a different mentality when it comes to tile and resilient installations. As you can see here, um, the joint treatment is uh, done many times with this membrane. It's an epoxy, and what they do is they add sand to it, and they fill all the joints. And for sheet vinyl applications, they may weld every joint in the entire floor together, which is totally different than what we know of with ANSI. They have a flexible material they're putting over all these joints. We have a very hard surface that doesn't bend very well. So it's a, different, um, it's a different method and we need to be aware of it. Same goes for uh, self-leveling products. Um, just as we have here and illustrates uh, the different trials, you know, you'll get a different result with the different trials. You'll get um, some are easier to use than others. It's the same thing that happens with levelers. There are different types of levelers and some are designed for um, filling deep uh, depressions. Some have higher flow, slower flow. To some degree, you get what you pay for. For example, if you buy an economy SLU, it's going to be a slower flow, uh, so you'll have to work it a little bit more in order to move it around, and you have a minimum uh, thickness, and that's a quarter of an inch. Whereas with others, you may have a standard setting or extended setting product that you're gonna to have to wait for an extended period of time if you have moisture sensitive materials that are going on. You have your high builds that you can go up to three inches in one pour. And for many of these high builds and other levers, you can add pea gravel and go up to five inches. Um, but these high build ones are less likely to shrink. So that might make it a little easier for you to do the deep pours. What is also very popular is the lightweight uh, type SLUs and um, specifiers like them, especially on suspended slabs, lowering the weight to uh, 30% or more, it makes a big difference. Over plywood, uh, you may use a fiber reinforced uh, SLU where you don't have to use lath. And that makes a big difference because the fibers help and the uh, high latex helps in order to uh, keep the product from cracking over a flexible surface. And then these other high performance materials, they give you extra features. There's even uh, wear surface SLUs that, for example, if you were to work on a project and you had the, uh, the self-leveling, but they weren't going to be able to tile for many months, it's uh, critical to have something that could stand up to wear because many air conditioning um, units have been plugged up with dust from self-leveling or patch uh, due to construction track. So you might want to consider a wear surface SLU in those conditions. So the standard also helps you in your specifications and discussions with general contractors for uh, conditions on site. Section 221 talks about the um, ambient conditions and humidity uh, it also uh, provides the precautions for um, your product storage. A couple of the key features here is um, once you get over 90 degrees or under 50 degrees, your product is not going to react properly. Especially be very careful about the 50 degree minimum because once you start installing cement products under 50, you will not get the reaction and the uh, strengths that you are expected to get. Another thing to be ca very careful about is the amount of humidity that's in the room. If you've ever installed a large area of self-leveling, you can feel the humidity coming up into the air or because of the moisture, you'll feel the humidity, um, especially if you have it closed off. We've seen issues where an area is so closed off with plastic 
that condensation develops on the surface of the leveler because you have such high humidity and you're at the dew point. And so now you're, you're getting the surface of the leveler becomes very weak and powdery if you have too much uh, humidity. For those installers who are listening, uh, please take care when you're in those type of environments. The standard also calls out for um, the surface preparation types and helps you appreciate the good, better, best systems. Um, shop blasting, bringing it to a concrete surface profile of number three is ideal. Um, also, the grinding at a CSP of two can be acceptable, um, but be very careful. You may have uh, surfaces that have a little more profile. The grinding process has to be done correctly. With sanding, um, sanding is done or screening is done in order to remove um, taping compound paints, et cetera, on the surface. But if you're using it as your primary um, surface prep, be very careful because uh, sometimes doing the sanding, you'll just um, put dust into the surface and we've seen failures with areas that have been sanded. So always try to shoot for the best type of surface preparation. We're very familiar, all tile contractors are, with mixing cement. We know what happens to grout when we overwater it. Um, same thing with levelers. Levelers also require a certain range of water and also needs to be mixed for um, a certain period of time. One of the things that we see here is um, the minimum hose requirements. It's not often talked about, but there are certain pumps that only mix for a few seconds in, in their um, in line. And then most of the mixing and the, um, all the chemicals combining happens in the hose. And so the minimum hose length stick to approximately 100 feet or more that will give you enough mixture of the self-leveling so that way when it actually gets placed on the floor that it's mixed properly. Um, if you go with really short mixers, you have to have a, a, a pump that does some mixing on the front end in order to get uh, a proper mixture. Again, the overwatering, underwatering, that all makes a big difference. Uh, primers are also a key part of um, the insulation with a self-leveling. If you mess up the primer, your whole system can fail. So um, you really have to know what you're doing and you have to follow the instructions from the manufacturer. Uh, we found that using a push broom in order to move primer over a porous surface, latexes, that works best. Um, some will try sprayers and and a um, and a roller doesn't work that well. So for latex over porous surfaces, use a broom. Push that latex around. Don't leave puddles. Um, that's the best method. For uh, if you're going over uh, an epoxy membrane, uh, if you're going over uh, an existing smooth surface, you can use a roller. Uh, and again, don't leave a uh, puddles because puddles, when they cure back, it's like you're leaving a uh, a film of plastic on the on the surface. That's not something that you want. Primer makes a big difference in the performance of a leveler. As you can see in the picture here, um, an improperly primed surface is going to suck the life out of the self leveling process and it's not going to flow to its proper degree. It may not stick very well. Um, your surface is definitely not gonna come out the same way that you'd like it to be. And so you wanna install the primer properly. And unfortunately, some persons believe that more is better. That's not true with a primer. So again, as I can't emphasize enough, use the right coverage rate, map it out, and figure the right coverage rate when you're using a primer. And then you'll get the results that you can see in this picture on the left. Uh, at times, you may have to broadcast sand into an epoxy, and that's usually for extra heavy duty um, 
installations. So you would roll on an epoxy, broadcast sand to rejection, and then the next day come back and vacuum up all the excess sand. And that's a great way to assure that you have a high strength bond to a surface um, with heavy loading, et cetera. One of the things that contractors run into all the time is, is time and schedules. So you're, you're the finish and you're in there last and you have all these persons working around you and they wanna get on your leveler. Well, as you can see here, the standard um, tells you that you know you have to have, or, or explains what the um, strengths of the product are. And if you look at the graph, you can see to the right, there is a sweet spot where after three to seven days in that time frame, and it's gonna be affected by temperature, humidity, uh, thickness of the product, um, a lot of things are gonna affect the curing, but within three to seven days, you're gonna get a leveling product that's gonna be strong enough to stand up to heavy traffic. And these graphs, the standard, that's gonna help you to debate with the general contractor as to when you can have traffic over your level. It's not a good idea to pour the leveler and cover it up immediately um, because you want it to cure out. And it won't take long before it'll get to some higher strengths. As you can see, this is um, a standard grade SLU, but it's a, a rapid setting product. Within a day, you're up to 2000 PSI. So you could, that's, that's average. So you, you can have foot traffic, you can install heating elements in that time frame, or you can turn on heating elements in that time frame if you're in a cold area. But heavy traffic, um, you want to hold off a little bit. Another question that we get often is, how do I know that the leveler is ready for a moisture sensitive product? Well, most manufacturers will have on their on their data sheets or packages when they believe that time frame uh, will allow you to put a moisture sensitive product. When I see moisture sensitive, I think of a stone. Some membranes are moisture sensitive. Uh, some grouts uh, need a little more time with less moisture in order to cure out properly. So generally after 16 hours with a rapid set product, you really won't have any issues. But if a general contractor or someone else says, well, you need to demonstrate to me that this product is ready, um, the two uh, ASTMs for um, reading relative humidity or um, moisture vapor transmission, they're not relevant to a uh, self-leveling product. And it states so in the, in the standard. The reason for that, it comes off so often where people ask this, but there's no vapor drive that's coming out of a leveler. It's just residual moisture uh, that's going to dissipate over time. It's not going to affect the moisture sensitive materials even if it shows it with a Tramex meter or something else, um, those uh, tests are just not relevant for leveling. And you can find that in standard. So with the use of any standard, it, the goal is to set the matter straight, give you something to rely on, to go back to, um, something that tells you that when you buy a product from a manufacturer, it's going to have a minimum performance standard. And hope you never run into a situation where you're being forced or told that you're being forced to level a project versus flattening. The standard will help you with that. Also with the site conditions and surface preparation, we finally have a standard in the tile industry for self-level. And hopefully we'll have one for mortar beds and, and other uh, products that we use in our assemblies that are not defined at the moment. But as you can see, the um, manufacturers, the labor groups, the technical committees, all of them take them very seriously. And uh, it took a long time for these standards to come about, but they're definitely very um, high quality and they're going to benefit our industry. So I want to thank you for attending and 
Uh, I hope uh, you're able to learn something about our standards that you can apply. And if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them for you. Mike, great presentation. A lot of information on the standards and how they came about, what they are. I have a quick question. So you were talking about primers. And you showed those kids that primed their television and their floor and their furniture and the curtain and everything. Um, I was just wondering, are they still grounded? Yeah, they're William White's kids. Uh, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> they're just like that. <laughs> I thought that was a cute picture. All right, yeah. we have one question here for sure. Um, and the question is, Mike, can I eliminate profiling a smooth concrete floor by using a bond promoting primer if so, would I still need to use an SLU primer on top of that? So uh, it's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that comes up all the time is um, whether a surface is smooth or whether it's smooth and non-absorptive. So there, if you have a, all of these latex primers, um, prefer to have a, pro, a surface that's porous or absorptive. So there's an ASTM and it's uh, ASTM F3191 and it defines how you do a mo uh, an absorption test. You basically drop a bead of water. Uh, it's about a quarter of the diameter of a dime. You drop it from about a half an inch um, using a pipette or a eyedropper, about a half inch from the slab. And if it absorbs within a minute, then it's absorptive. The reason why I say that is when you put these latex primers on there, you're going to get a very, very strong bond when you use a bonding primer or you use any other primer. And so that's kind of the, what I would, that's the first thing I would look at. So to answer the question, can you go over a non-absorptive or a smooth surface with a bonding primer? Yes, you can. But look at the application. If the application is slab on ground and you're getting normal commercial traffic without heavy loading, it's not really much of an issue. You can do that. But if you're going to go over a suspended slab, you might want to think twice about whether you're going to profile it, especially if it's non-absorptive. The reason for that is a lot of it is determined by the deflection that's going to happen in the slab. If you have high traffic, heavy loading, and you're over a suspended slab, you're going to get a lot of deflection. If you don't have the appropriate amount of movement joints, or if you have excessive deflection, it's more likely to shear off a smooth, non absorptive surface than it would off an absorptive surface that you really got a strong bond to. And I know that's a long winded technical explanation, <laughs> but I just had to say it all. It's great. Make sure you're uh, uh, succinct in uh, the way you answer those questions and go through the whole thing. That's great. So, Mike, a lot of times uh, the way a presentation is uh, presented, uh, programs presented, webinars presented, tells a lot of the questions that are asked. And that was the only question we had. I want to make sure that everybody that is still here sees Michael's uh, contact information, his email address, his phone number, because while you're doing these projects that are using SLUs and uh, flowable uh, uh, cement, <laughs> I can't even remember what the name is anymore. So uh, when you're using them, make sure you, uh, you call, right? And uh, ask questions before you put yourself in a bad situation or in a tough situation as they go to help. Michael and everybody, I wanna thank you. Um, this was a great presentation. It was a lot of information. It will be available for all of you to watch at any time, probably starting Wednesday on uh, the NTCA YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's something you have to kind of go through a couple times to catch everything and see everything that's uh, relevant to what's taking place in uh, the SLU uh, platform that we have right now going on. So uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks everybody for attending. I uh, hope to see all of you at Coverings. If you do, come by the NTCA um, booth at Coverings, N2862. Uh, we'll be there and uh, look forward to all of you. So thank you. By the way, the day before the show starts, we have a ANSI uh, 
as Mark was, as Mike was talking about ANSI, we do have an ANSI meeting. We'll be talking about lots of information for ANSI. So uh, very uh, interesting things going on. Thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a good week. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate everything. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody for attending. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.